Welcome to Worship at St. Andrews on this uh, Sunday, July 5th. Thank you so much for joining us and making us uh, part of your weekend. Uh, please see this week's bulletin as there are a number of announcements, including information on how to join the virtual coffee hour on Zoom at 1230 following today's service. There's also information there on how to fill out our reopening survey, and we will be receiving responses until July the 13th. As well, please note that myself and some of the church staff are taking vacation this week. This means that the church offices will be closed until Monday, July the 13th. And as well, for next Sunday, July 12th, Jillian, Terry Lynn, and myself will be taking a one Sunday break from worship. Uh, however, next week I invite you to support our Synod summer students, who we have already met a couple of weeks ago, Samuel Andre and Jacqueline Cleland, as they'll be leading worship virtually from First Presbyterian Church in Regina. And to see that service, it's going to be at 11 o'clock on Sunday, July the 12th, and recorded afterwards. You can find information on how to view the service in our bulletin as well. Finally, please see the rest of the bulletin for announcements on Funscript, Outreach, Camp Christopher, and a special, special message from St. Andrew's Hall. Friends, let us begin our worship with a word of prayer. How wonderful are your works, O God! How great are your ways! You are generous in love and kindness, endless in goodness and power, overflowing with grace and mercy. You fill the world with truth and justice, and offer all people hope and new beginnings. Lord and lover of all, we praise and adore you as Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit, this day and always. For in Christ we know you are always near. Amen. Our opening hymn is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Thank you. 
Will you please, please join me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletins? Lifting up our voices, we say together, Good and gracious God, like Paul the Apostle, we struggle between knowing and doing. Knowing what is right and yet feeling unable to do it. We share with him in the anguish of feeling our sin within us while knowing that you have died to free us from it. With Paul, we cry out, who will deliver us? Even though we know that it is you, Christ our Lord, who has already freed us from all trouble and turmoil. Forgive us, O Lord. Blot out our transgressions. Give us courage to hear the good news again and to believe it wholly. Turn us once again to your glory and show us your grace. Amen. Friends in Christ, hear the good news. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. God's compassion reaches out to all of creation. Know that you are forgiven through Christ our Lord. Live in peace in harmony with yourself and with all people. Amen. Our second hymn is, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. As we approach God's word this morning, let us come to him in prayer. Come as light, O God, and enlighten our darkness. Come as truth, O Christ, and give us wisdom. Come as love, O Spirit, and shape our lives. Come to us, holy God, so that we may learn to follow you in all our ways. Amen. Our first reading is from Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 7, verses 15 to 25. Romans 7 at the 15th verse. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. 
Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be that a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind I am slave to the law of God, but with my flesh I am a slave to the law of sin. Our Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 19 and 25 to 30. Hear the word of the Lord. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. What I say now, I say in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This morning, as we reflect together on the words of Paul in his letter to the Romans and the words of Jesus in his words in the Gospel of Matthew, I want to make a change from my usual pattern of preaching and to do something a little bit different, a little bit more personal. Normally, I have realized, looking back at my recent sermon messages, I like to approach God and culture from above, from 10,000 feet, as one of my pastoral mentors used to call it, to look at the landscape of the world and the Bible and to find out how they fit together and how the gospel changes and challenges the landscape of a world that is usually oblivious or even hostile to it. Today, however, I want to do something a bit differently. I want to share with you some of my own personal journey that led me to Christ in the first place and that eventually led me to preaching and pastoring in this wonderful community. And specifically, I want to tell you about my journey with Paul as I learned to see myself not just as one stuck in sin and confusion, but eventually as one graciously saved by our Lord Jesus Christ. As a young man in my late teens and early 20s, I had never been a churchgoer or a Bible reader. In fact, other than a few visits to a community church as a Cub Scout and a few trips to Catholic Mass with my grandparents, I had hardly set foot in a church at all. Even so, growing up in Canada, largely in the 90s and 2000s, it was still possible to absorb some of the gospel by osmosis, just from the Christian culture around me. And even though I didn't go to church or read the Bible, I could still quote, for instance, Jesus' golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And even the promise of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And as well, a curious little verse from some guy named Paul, who is apparently also somewhere in the Bible, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. In my pre-Christian state, Paul's words rang truer maybe than any of the other pieces of biblical wisdom I had absorbed. What good is it trying to be good to others? What good is it believing in a good and loving God if we can't seem to stop ourselves from doing evil anyways? 
like a lot of people, young or otherwise, struggling to hear God's call in my life, there seemed to be too much in the way. Sin, evil, confusion, by which I mean personal sin, personal evil, and personal confusion. Not that God was unreachable, but that even if he was, I didn't know how to go about it. And Paul apparently could relate, where he says in Romans 7 at the 15th verse, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. No, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For myself, for Paul, for all of us, the first part of this message is clear enough. As human beings, it is often difficult to understand our own behavior and the things we want. It is difficult to understand why we cannot help but do the things we know to be wrong. It is even difficult, or maybe especially difficult, when we have a law to tell us what is good and what is wrong. When we begin to learn just how much we rely on the law to keep us from total wickedness. As a young person struggling to know and to turn to God, this reality made it even more difficult. How can I go to him? How can I face God or the people who serve him when I know that I am not perfect like they are? That the struggle was named right in scripture was apparently lost on me in the moment. You see, as someone outside the church, as someone who picked up his ideas of God and of Christians and church, From across the street of culture, I naively believe that Christians were who the culture presented them to be. Perfect, unflappable, secure. Always knowing who they were, where they were going, and what they were doing. To me, in my limited state, Christians were those clean-cut kids in my university classes who all got straight A's and never cursed in the hallways. They were those people on TV with their hands in the air and their eyes closed, high on some kind of spiritual energy that apparently never faded. They were the people at the Waffle House on Sunday morning who hadn't been awake since the night before. From where I was sitting, from where I was living, Christians were like another species, or robots maybe. Cleaner, sleeker, not stained by this world, its sin, or its confusion. When finally, after years of talking myself in and out of it, I finally attended my first Christian worship service at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Lethbridge, what I found was not a building filled with perfect robot people, but a building filled with kind people, patient people, people who were not perfect themselves but had confidence that this perfection nevertheless existed because they had seen it somehow. As I continued to attend worship, as I learned to pray and to sing hymns and to read the Bible, I was compelled to come back each and every week, not only because of the God that I was finally getting to know, but because of the people who I felt a kinship with in this journey. Paul's words in Romans, at least in the first half of the reading, for as wise and as descriptive of truth as they are, could almost be written by any human being at any time with even a small understanding of good and evil. Almost anyone could say, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. That is not the gospel, that is just the human condition. When we read on, however, we can see how Paul has written these things for the glory of God. At verse 22, he writes, For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind 
making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The point among Paul's many subtle and brilliant points about the law and sin in these verses is not that following Christ makes us perfect, not that we have some sort of Teflon skin that the dirt of the world will not stick to. It is that we do indeed know sin. We know sin, we know evil, and we know the sin within us that chooses evil over good. However, for as threatening as these realities are, they do not threaten the greater reality of Christ's salvation. The Christian life, far from being the life of ease and comfort and perfection that I saw it to be many years ago, is not about being better or greater or even more resilient in the face of sin. It is about knowing that we have and will be saved. And just as importantly, knowing from whom our help has and will come. Being a Christian, a follower of Christ, means knowing who and whose we are. That we are human beings, just as limited and tempted and susceptible to the powers of sin, anyone inside or outside of the church, but that we are human beings who have seen God in human flesh. That seeing Christ, knowing Christ, even just hearing the good news of Christ for the first time has, in fact, changed our reality. Not that we are less human, but that we know we are no longer hopeless captives to sin and evil and confusion. We are free, as Paul shows us, to proclaim victory, as he says in seemingly contradictory statements. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In the closing of his reflection on the law and the sin within him that chooses evil, Paul ends with this conclusion. So then, with my mind I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh I am a slave to the law of sin. In a previous life I might have read these words and believed that the task was, in fact, hopeless. That even that if even Paul, the great apostle, could admit that he was a slave to the sin of his flesh, what hope did I have? But that is not the lesson we should take from this. In describing the apparent space between his mind and his flesh, the mind that wants to serve God and the flesh that wants only to serve sin, Paul describes only what is. That as a human being, he cannot claim to be anything else. As a human being, he cannot deny the sin that lives within him, choosing to do evil. However, that is not to say that he is hopeless in this fact. Paul shows us the way to victory. A victory that can only be won when we allow both the problem of sin and we ourselves to sit open to the solution that is Christ. Yes, we have minds that seek to know and serve God. And yes, we have bodies marked by sin that serve only themselves. But what is far more important than either of these facts is that we have a Savior who can empathize with us. In Jesus Christ, God has entered into our human condition. God has entered into our very flesh to show us that what we could not achieve for ourselves the fulfillment of the law and the end of sin. That when Jesus Christ, the fullness of God within him, took on the cross to save us from our sins, died and rose three days later, he did achieve our victory. Not a victory we would design for ourselves. Not the instant end of temptation or evil or sin. Not the end to humanity as we know it and struggle through it but rather the salvation of that humanity in love. 
Friends, when Christ took the burden of the cross upon himself, he did so while knowing who he was saving. Not a perfect humanity. Not a humanity that would stop sinning as soon as it was accomplished, but a humanity that would look to that cross, to that empty tomb, to the scriptures and know the lengths that God has gone to reveal himself to each of us in Jesus Christ. And that by knowing how much we are loved, we would no longer be afraid to follow him and even to accept ourselves as we are. In this life, with these human minds and these human bodies, we are still far from perfection. We are still mired in sin and our constant struggle of temptation. The good news is not that we are anything greater than this, anything greater than a mind that seeks to know God and a body that seeks to sin, but that we know our salvation has already been won for us. Years ago, when I set foot for the first time in that church in Lethbridge, I met people who, though not perfect themselves, had glimpsed perfection for themselves. What I realized some time later is that I had glimpsed the promise and community of life in Christ. That even when we ourselves are struggling in sin, even when we ourselves are feeling hopeless or lost or confused, we have among us our fellow saints in Christ who remind us of the vision we once had and will have again. That glimpsing this salvation, glimpsing the Savior, glimpsing Christ, we will once again remember who we are and more importantly, whose we are. The beloved children of a God who has stopped at nothing to save us. That even when the burden of life seems unbearable, even when we feel like we cannot endure our sin or our temptation any longer, our Lord comes close and reminds us of who we are and the love that he has for us just as we are. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. Friends, at this time, I would invite you to uh, present your offerings as uh, gifts to God. Um, please present uh, gifts of time, gifts of treasure, or gifts of talent as you are able, and uh, visit our website for more information on how to give. Thank you.
Friends, let us pray once again, this time in the prayers of God's people. I would invite you to respond to the prompt, Lord, in your mercy, with the words, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God of mystery and meaning, help us to discover your purpose for our lives. Free us from the limits set by past expectations and experience, and keep us open to all possibilities. Bless those who extend the boundaries of love and respect, who show kindness to strangers, and forgiveness to people who have wronged them. Work among us by your spirit to heal the invisible wounds of the heart. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, this day we pray for all those suffering the dehumanizing effects of racism. Send your spirit upon victim and perpetrator and show us all our oneness in you. Work among us by your spirit, which has created every human being and love and dignity. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for your wisdom to inspire our leaders, politicians, judges, lawyers, and police, and all who form and keep our laws. Work among us by your spirit to recognize injustice and respond to create systems that reflect your grace. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all those who are ill or in chronic pain, for those grieving the loss of loved ones, those separated from them by the current pandemic, and for all who feel afraid for the future. Work among us by your spirit and renew our commitment to pray for and serve one another. Lord, in your mercy. We pray also for those affected economically and personally by the pandemic. And we pray that they would find livelihood and meaning in work once again. Give courage to those who have lost so much and creativity to those in the midst of reorganizing their lives. Work among us by your spirit to rebuild common life with an eye to the most vulnerable. Lord, in your mercy. Finally, O Lord, we pray for those people and causes written most closely upon our hearts this day in the silence of this moment. Finally, Lord, hear us as we close our time of prayer in the words taught to us by your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Forth in Your Name, O Lord, I Go.
In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May we go forth from this time of worship and into the world in love, grace, and fellowship, remembering our salvation in Jesus Christ and remembering one another as our support and fellowship. And in the words of the Apostle Paul, may we be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine.